Hello and welcome everyone to our special COVID uh, session uh, number eight, uh, an initiative of um, the ASLM, Africa CDC, um, FIND, ICVIA, and the Korea World Bank Partnership. My name is Anafi Mataka, and I will be your moderator today. Um, in response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, particularly the need for testing, which has been the backbone for this fight. Uh, ASLM um, and partners are dedicating a series of these eco sessions to focus on COVID-19 diagnostics, for which there is still so much to learn. And one of the key stakeholders that we believe play a key role in this fight are our manufacturers. So we are priv privileged today uh, to host two of them, and we appreciate them for taking time off their busy schedule to come uh, here and be with us uh, today. As you know, we have already uh, hosted some before, BD, Safiaid, Kyogen, and Thermo Fisher. Today, we are hosting the third set uh, of our manufacturers uh, in the form of Abbott and Bayerad Company. They will specifically talk to us about what they are offering uh, in terms of the technical aspects of various technologies, uh, particularly the molecular tests uh, that they are offering. Um, we are not here uh, as a reminder to provide a marketing platform uh, for industry, but really to provide a platform where everyone can technically contribute to this fight. Therefore, we will not deal with issues that are more into marketing, more into price, pricing in a way that would sort of steer competition or selling. Uh, a few household rules. Today's session will be one hour and 15 minutes long, and we shall have two presentations. Uh, each will be about 20 minutes, followed by a question and answer segment. You have all been muted, so we will kindly ask you to enter your questions and comments to the chat box. We will start with Abbott, and I will introduce the speaker from Abbott, uh, Dr. Danigella Lusic. Dr. Lusic received her PhD in biochemistry from Rush Medical Center, Chicago. Uh, in the USA and completed her postdoctoral training at the University of Illinois in Chicago as well. She joined Abbott um, Molecular in 2006 and is currently part of the global scientific affairs team, which is uh, responsible for HIV-1, hepatitis, and transplant products. At Abbott, she has worked closely with R&D on developing and optimizing dry blood spot protocols, and more recently, SARS-CoV-2 assays. During her tenure at Abbott, she has been involved in translation research of molecular diagnostics and their impact on patient management. Uh, she's also a certified uh, board, uh, she's also board certified in infectious diseases uh, and is a, a subspecialty in HIV medicine. Over the course of the career, uh, he has uh, worked uh, uh, together uh, to produce uh, many of uh, outstanding uh, efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to uh, hand over to uh, Dani Jela. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Anafi. Um, let me share my slides. And you can see them, correct? Yes, perfect. All right, perfect, thank you. Thank you, Anathi, and thank you to ASLM for this opportunity, really to allow you to update you on our SARS-CoV-2 assay and the work that our research and development team ha has done and continues to do in order to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as Anathi mentioned, today we'll really spend our time speaking about the first assay that was launched as part of our Abbott portfolio, which is the real-time SARS-CoV-2 assay on the M2000 platform. 
um, this assay is um, FDA EUA approved um, or has the EUA approval, then it also is approved um, for a CIVD use in, um, select, in, in those specific markets. Um, the other assays that are also available as part of this portfolio that you may have heard over the last few months um, is the ID Now, which is our point, point of care platform, which provides results in short of as five minutes for positive patients and then 13 uh, minutes for um, negative patients that are negative for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the most recent addition to this portfolio is our IgG assay that's um, performed on the Architect um, I system. Um, this platform um, is widely available and then it's also approved both um, in the US as well as in um, EMEA markets. And then continuing this fight um, for SARS-CoV-2, we do have several products that are still in development. Um, two that I will mention right off the bat here is you see the LNVM SARS-CoV-2 um, assay. This, this assay is uh, to be utilized on our LNVM platform, uh, which is a high throughput platform, which is able to provide up to 300 results in eight hours. And then additionally, our serology um, team is also working on an IgM assay, which will be also performed on the Architect um, I system. Our um, rapid diagnostic colleagues are also working on an IgG and IgM product, um, which you know, they'll be able to share with you in the future sessions. Uh, with ASLM. So as I mentioned, this um, session is really going to be focused on M2000 and, and capabilities of this particular assay that we're looking to um, you know, bring to uh, sub-Saharan market. Um, M2000, as most of you may be familiar, is, is a polyvalent um, platform that has a very broad menu. Um, and it does have a wide distribution across the sub-Saharan continent. As you can see, um, the areas that are shaded in green are where the, we have M2000 placements. And as I mentioned from a menu perspective, although most of you may be familiar with M2000 specific to our viral load, HIV viral load assay for both either plasma or dry blood spots, as you can see, um, the platform itself has a very broad menu. And more recently, we've added um, this real-time SARS-CoV-2 assay um, to this platform um, as a qualitative assay. This particular assay from a specimen type perspective is approved for nasal um, swabs, nasal pharyngeal swabs, um, or oral pharyngeal swabs. Um, the swab material uh, should be Decron or nylon swabs, and it should be placed within one to three ml of sterile vial transport media. Now, the most common collection devices that have been utilized in the field are those from BB um, and Copand. Either one of those uh, would be suitable for the utility of this particular um, assay on our system. Um, from a specimen uh, or sample preparation perspective, um, primary specimens can be loaded directly onto the system without the need for any manual pipetting or transfer to a secondary tube. Um, the sample racks can be custom calibrated in order to minimize um, any dead volume that might be needed per sample. And then in a case where a secondary tube um, must be used because it, the primary tube isn't compatible with the rack or with the system, um, there is an option also to use a secondary tube um, on the system, and here you could use either a reaction vessel that's already utilized on the system for extraction, or you could use our master mix transport tube um, to transfer your sample from a primary tube into a secondary tube. And here as well, you could utilize a custom rack calibration, again, to minimize the required dead volume per sample. I should mention that um, our extraction um, uses 500 microliters of sample to extract, and we're asking to have between 800 to 1 ml of sample in the tube. Again, this is going to be dependent on that custom rack calibration and, and uh, tube diameter that we're using for that particular um, calibration. From a sample um, uh, preparation or re, uh, reagent preparation perspective and sample extraction perspective, um, we're using our tulonucleic acid extraction chemistry. This is something that those of you that are using our HIV 
qual assay are going to be very um, familiar with. This is the same um, reagent setup as we use for that particular assay where we're adding ethanol to lysis, uh, wash one and wash two. This changes this chemistry to total nucleic acid extraction chemistry. And we've seen that this um, approach um, provides really robust extraction across the various different respiratory sample types. From a target selection um, perspective, we target RDRP, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and the end target gene. Um, this, these targets were selected in close collaboration with our core research and viral discovery group. Um, they, at the time of assay design, um, did extensive analysis to ensure that the regions we've selected are highly conserved and allow us to um, you know, really have a broad um, detection of various different strains that might be available today or as we move um, into the future with this particular um, pandemic. So if we look at where the CDC assay um, that was initially launched and available to a number of markets, um, they have three different probes which are all located, located within the end target region of the gene. Um, the other assay that is more commonly um, been referenced to is the Cherry K assay, and this assay has three different um, assays before you actually get to the final um, discriminatory result um, where a patient is diagnosed um, as SARS-CoV-2 positive. They have probes within the E-target region. If that's positive, then you move down to the confirmatory assay uh, probes. Um, then if this, is, um, if this assay is positive, positive, then you move down to finally the discriminatory assay probes. Um, as I mentioned, our assay is targeting both RDRP as well as the end target regions, um, providing you the dual target single-stranded um, coverage of the probes. Uh, and both of those probes are labeled with a SAM dye, so a single dye reaction um, with for a single, um, within a single well, I should say. From a sample handling perspective, um, you know, that workflow um, in the laboratory is going to be very similar to what you're used to with your HIV um, specimens. Once the sample is um, collected and arrives to the laboratory, what we're asking you is really to remove the swab prior to loading it onto the system. And then processing beyond that um, step is really very similar to what you might be used to with your viral load assay or our HIV EID qual assay. And what I mean by that is that you load your specimens in the primary tube, in the, your primary tube into um, RS, you load your reagents, um, you initiate your extraction, that whole process is, is fully automated. At the end, the master mix um, is added um, to the PCR plate, and then you transfer that onto the um, amplification and detection. And really, the final result um, from a resulting perspective is very simple and uh, reportable to the physician for patient management. Um, from a resulting perspective, here you can see what those results might look like on the final M2000 um, RT screen. Again, very simple, clear results um, for easy interpretation uh, by the end user um, at the conclusion of each run. So there's no additional manipulation or interpretation that needs to occur by the end user. Um, so what you can see here is that you have a sample ID that will be listed um, as part of the software. You do see a cycle number that is um, reported out for that particular patient's viral um, uh, shedding, if you will. Then you also see an interpretation, which will be either positive or negative. Um, this result, if you have the ability to connect your um, M2000 to a laboratory information system, could directly be reported out then um, for um, expedited patient care. You do also have the ability to review the amplification curves. Um, now, you know, this is a screenshot of the target amplification curves and what you might see from a, a summary um, run perspective. Now, I do want to, um, you know, emphasize that you can see this for both target as well as the internal control. Um, this is not a requirement as part of the reporting. This is really, you know, providing that, uh, you know, added value to the end user in case you needed to do any troubleshooting for a particular run, it might be useful to look at those amplification curves. 
Um, but again, this is not a requirement that you would need to review uh, amplification curves as part of your result reporting. We do believe that uh, the result screen that I um, show here is providing adequate ability for you to report those um, results out directly to your physicians as we're implementing number of data reduction parameters that are evaluating um, specificity of those amplification curves. So really what that throughput and that workflow looks like on M2000, um, if we really focus on looking at um, one instrument set, if you will, um, here where we have um, ability to do up to two batches within that single shift and looking at and extending that up to two shifts and then potentially even three shifts. Um, what we see here is that within a single shift, you're able to result out a full plate of 96 uh, results. This is going to include two controls and 94 patient um, results. You can initiate that second run um, if you do that staggered approach, and then the results of that second run are reported out during that second shift. Um, and so this staggered approach where you're setting up the um, extraction or second extraction as soon as the first um, uh, extraction is on the amplification and detection really allows you to increase that throughput on the M2000. Now this is really not specific to just SARS-CoV-2. Um, the turnaround time on the HIV quant assay and the qual assay is very comparable to the SARS-CoV-2 assay. So your first run of the day could be your HIV quant assay. The second run could be a SARS-CoV-2. Um, and similarly here, you can do another run of SARS-CoV-2 and then start your HIV um, run. So this is really just dependent on you know, the ability that you have within your institution to scale up this testing and be able to provide kind of this, this extended um, ability of coverage across multiple um, shifts. Um, so what you can see with the single M2000 system, across the full 24 hours, we're able to process up to 470 tests. This is not including controls. Um, and so the, the last result, if you will, is, is coming off a little bit after that 24-hour um, time span. Um, if you look at the throughput on M2000, uh, with two M2000, I should say, which you can see across those two systems and then three shifts, we're able to process up to 970 um, test results. And then lastly, with three M2000, here you can see that we're, that we're able to process up to 1,400 test results. And again, this could be a mix of various different assays that your laboratory might be um, responsible for processing at this time. Okay, the next um, set of slides will be really focused on um, the assay performance um, and what that looks like um, for our particular assay. So I'll cover limited detection, reactivity or inclusivity, and then cross reactivity and clinical performance. So limited detection um, of this particular assay was verified using the BI standard from NIH, um, as well as using the Seracare Acuplex um, control, which um, value assigns using digital PCR. So you can see here that we tested 400 copies, 300 copies, 200 and 100 copies. We had detection, 100% um, detection at um, 400 to 200 copies and at 100 copies per ml, our detection was 95.2%. So our claim within our insert is that our um, limited detection for this particular assay is 100 copies per ml. Now, inclusivity, um, this, um, Study was performed at, at the initial start of assay design, and you can see at the time um, that we did this analysis, there were about 78 sequences that we were able to um, compare our assay, whether or not it will be able to detect these various different strains and sequences that have been published. Um, so the 78 sequences across um, you know, 10 different countries, we haven't at that point um, had any challenges in, in being able to detect these different sequences. I'll tell you that um, more recently, as of this week, we did go back um, to this um, sequence database to evaluate um, the sequences that have been published um, to date and that are available. There's approximately 1,300 um, sequences that have been 
um, added to this database since um, early March. And so when we compare those sequences now, these sequences are much broader. They're across 26 different countries. Um, again, we were able to identify 100% of the strains that have been uh, published to date. And again, speaking to um, you know, that highly conserved nature of the target region that we selected um, in collaboration with our viral discovery team. We also performed in silico analysis, and here is really where we're looking at those, any of those potential cross-reacting um, organisms that could um, report out as a false positive for, the, um, for that particular result, and both in silico analysis um, of various different um, strains for our primary and probe sequence, um, did not identify a potential issue where we would be uh, reporting out a false positive. Um, due to cross-reactivity. Now, we also did look at um, close to uh, or 31 different organisms um, and appropriate representative specimens across these various different species. And you can see here the different concentrations that were evaluated as part of this study. And again, even in this clinical um, setting, we did not see any organisms that uh, would impact the assay performance and potentially would report out a false positive. From a clinical performance perspective, um, here we looked at 61 contrived um, specimens. So these were nasal pharyngeal specimens that were um, spiked with um, recombinant virus. And you can see that we looked at 1x to 2x LOD. Um, we looked at 20 replicates um, and we were able to detect all 20. And then at 20x LOD, we had 40 replicates that we tested. And again, all 40 were detected. Um, and we did have 31 um, clinical negative, uh, clinically negative um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, specimens that were tested as part of this um, assay. And you can see that we um, did not have any false positives. Again, that positive and negative agreement um, was 100% regarding whether we're, we're looking at the low positives or the true negatives. So in summary, this assay is a qualitative assay, um, single well for a single result. Um, single strand linear probes are utilized um, for the analysis. Um, both of those probes that are within this dual target region um, are labeled with the same dye. Um, the runtime from start of extraction to um, final result reporting is, is under seven hours, and this is for 96 results, including um, two controls. The throughput on the system for a single M2000 system, as we looked at um, during this presentation, is 470 patient um, samples in approximately 24 hours. The specimen type um, that's approved for this assay is nasal, nasopharyngeal, and oropharyngeal swabs. Result in interpretation, as I mentioned, is positive and negative. You do have the ability to look at the amplification curves um, if you needed to. Our sample extraction volume is 0.5 ml. We do add an internal control um, at the start of the extraction, just like we do for our viral load assays, um, and this is used to assess the extraction efficiency as well as the robustness of the PCR amplification curve. Um, and I did mention that we do require that there is one negative and one positive control that is being utilized per run. That's all I had, Anafi. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Lusic, uh, for the wonderful presentation. Um, colleagues, uh, hold on to your uh, questions, keep, on, uh, keep them coming into the chat box. We will now move on to uh, the second uh, uh, presentation, and this will be uh, co-presented uh, by Mr. Richie Petronis, who is the founder and head of commercial operations at Exact Diagnosis a BioRad Laboratories company, as well as Dr. Marcus Anosia, uh, who uh, at BioRad uh, is a product manager uh, 
for uh, and lead for genomics and uh, is located uh, in, in Germany. Uh, Dr. Marcus trained as a biologist and uh, joined Biorad after working in the fields of hematology, hypertension, prenatal diagnostics before joining Biorad in the 2000. Coincidentally, that same year, Biorad launched the iCycler IQ, uh, its first uh, quanti quantitative PCR instrument. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, help me welcome uh, colleagues from Biorad, uh, Dr. Marcus and Richie. Over to you. Thank you, Anati. Um, I will try to share my screen with you. It should be visible now. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Over. Hello, everyone. Firstly, I want to thank also the organizers for the invitation to this ASLM conference. Me and my colleague Richie Petronis will present to you today. Uh, some other Byrad colleagues may also join in later to answer your questions during the questions and answer session at the end of the presentation. We are happy to give you today an outline about who we are and how we may support you in your research and diagnostics in this COVID-19 pandemic situation. In the context of the cov 2 COVID-19, we will introduce to you various test systems. We will also touch on solutions you may expect from us in the near future. We have added some links and documents at the end of our presentation, so you will find additional relevant materials. Who is BioRed? BioRed was founded in 1952 and since then is a trusted partner in life sciences and clinical diagnostics. We are providing complementary products and new innovative technologies to our customers. In 2019, our sales exceeded $2 billion and we can look back on almost 65 years of ongoing success. BioRed is a global supplier selling either direct or by partners all around the world and we have more than 8,000 employees worldwide. This slide shows key materials we will talk about in the context of SARS-CoV-2 detection, and you'll find additional information on our webpage on www.bio-red.com. However, I'd like to start with, an, start with an outline of the circular process in fighting against any emerging infectious disease. The diagnostic testing, clinical characterization, clinical research and vaccine development are currently ongoing in parallel processes in a worldwide effort to combat COVID-19. In the next few slides, I will show you how BioRed is contributing to your efforts in this process and where BioRed technologies may fit in your workflow. This is a complex slide showing three major phases, diagnosis, confirmation and surveillance of patients with its onsets and durations. From virus infection to the onset of symptoms like coughing and fever, it takes between two to 11 days with the average around day two. During this time, the virus load is constantly increasing and virus RNA is detectable using either real-time qPCR or digital droplet PCR. Droplet, droplet digital PCR being the most sensitive and accurate method for virus detection and quantification. The virus load in patients will peak between day 10 and 15 and will then continuously decrease during patients' convalescence. It may remain measurable by um, quantitative PCR somewhere between day 20 to 25, and even longer by droplet digital PCR up until close to the virus disappearance. Droplet digital PCR could be a powerful complement to the current standard of testing, particularly during patients' convalescence. It may help to avoid releasing patients under the erroneous assumption that they are free of virus. Let's take a look to patients' immune response. EGM and EGA antibodies are detectable on average eight days after their infection. Their amount will peak around day 15. At that time, EGG antibody production will start and become detectable by serological testing a few days later and ongoing. While the early markers, EGM and EGA, will disappear later on, the EGG marker remains 
indicating COVID-19 immunity of individuals. It's currently not clear how long this immunity may last. This slide is still reflecting the, th the three different disease phases, but it also shows where BioRed's products may fit into your COVID-19 workflow. I will start on the left side. During diagnosis and screening, CVX96 and CVX384, well, real-time PCR systems, will help to get a fast and high throughput virus detection. Our Exact DX COVID-19 control kit has recently been launched. It represents five relevant COVID-19 target genes and is the most complete control kit available. My colleague Richie Patronis will tell you more about it in a few minutes. Along going with the infection, high levels of inflammatory cytokine markers may be measured using our BioPlex 200 system and our human cytokine 27 or 48 plex panels, indicating a disease progress. Once a virus load drops during patient's convalescence, it may get undetectable by real-time PCR and confirmation by using the more sensitive droplet digital PCR technique with our QX200 system may be recommended. It may prevent from any erroneous assumptions as it may detect persisting viruses in otherwise assumed non-infectious patients. To complement diagnosis or for screening of patients suspect to be already immune against COVID-19, our serological platelia SARS screening test can be applied by either using our high throughput diagnostic Evoles system or any benchtop ELISA reader. BioRed's BioPlex system in combination with our human cytokine 27 or 48 plex panels appear in several publications as the tool to measure serum level inflammatory cytokines. It's especially thus labs that want to get better understanding of COVID-19 disease who will continue monitoring those cytokine levels. It seems that high levels of IP10, MCP3 and interleukin one RA are associated with the disease progress. Real-time PCR is currently the method of choice for routine SARS-CoV-2 testing. Most of the commercially available tests are compatible with our CFX instruments, either the CFX rule or the CFX DX system. CFX systems have 96 or 384 well format and can be purchased with standard or deep well raw format. The deep well format allows to maximize sample volumes in order to improve detection sensitivity. Lots of in-house COVID-19 PCR protocols have been validated on our systems and are mentioned in clinical publications. We also provide co-PCR reagents and our one-step supermixes are broadly used for virus detection. ITEC one-step universal probe supermix will detect up to two gene targets and our new Reliance one-step supermix will even detect up to five different gene targets in one sample. Both supermixes can be used with or without an internal calibration dial like ROPS, which makes them compatible to most QPCR systems in the market. Our 96 or 384 well hard shell PCR plates have standard or low profile, and they are built by two different plastic components, making them very rigid. Besides manual handling, they can be implemented into any automation system, and our barcoded labeled plates can be easily tracked in any LIMP system. We currently have enormous requests for our QPCR consumables as plenty of labs are using LDT and EUR protocols that include those materials. While real-time quantitative PCR is the method of choice for SARS-CoV-2 detection, the data from Wuhan articles suggests that droplet digital PCR has improved sensitivity and is able to pick up infections missed by gold standard real-time PCR testing. Because of its robustness, droplet digital PCR has the advantage that tests do not need to be repeated on the same patient, like it's sometimes needed with real-time quantitative PCR testing. With its enhanced sensitivity, droplet digital PCR is ideal for determining whether it is safe to release patients from quarantine. While the detection threshold of COVID detection is at about 75 copies per sample using quantitative real-time PCR, our droplet digital PCR will be able to detect and quanti quantitate safely down to 25 copies per sample. 
Basically, the detection sensitivity of quantitative real-time PCR is improved by almost 200% using droplet digital PCR. Our droplet digital PCR systems are available in rural and IVD FDA approved formats. A company in the US, Biodesics, um, has recently submitted emergency use authority from the FDA and begun COVID-19 testing with our droplet digital PCR system. Our QX200 is also frequently used with our prime PCR expert design assays in combination with our dedicated DDPCR supermixes like the one-step RT DDPCR advanced supermix. We have recently adapted this to droplet digital PCR. And uh, we, we have adapted a CDC probe-based triplex assay that detects two targets on the SARS-CoV-2 engine and human RPP30 as a control. It will be soon available as an AUA approved kit in the US and as a rural kit elsewhere. I want to mention at that point that according to the advice of the WHO, each nucleic acid amplification test run should include both external and internal controls. And according to Professor Stephen Bustin, a world known authority in qPCR, CQ values are subject to inherent interrun variation and should not be used without appropriate calibration standards. The inclusion of known negative and positive control samples with each test run is an essential quality control parameter. With this, I will pass over to my colleague Richard Petronis to give us some more details about the recently launched Exactly X COVID 19 control kit. And I may pass over to you, Anafi. Um, okay, are you with, I with today? I'm not, no, I, um, Richie. no, I think Richie is there normally. Sorry, Marcus. Okay, there it is. Uh, there you go, Richie, just a second. Uh, Richie, can you hear us? Uh, Yes, thank you so much. And Marcus, thanks for the introduction. Let me uh, share my screen. Hello, everyone from Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And so uh, I'm going to cover the exact diagnostics, uh, SARS standard, uh, as well as the negative control. So uh, as you can see on the right side of the screen here, this is an actual uh, picture of the product. Um, what we did is we utilized droplet digital PCR to value assign our materials. These are in vitro transcripts that cover the five main gene targets, of which is E, N, and S. And these are the full length targets for ORF, 1A, and B. We have the base pairs of the products for that and we combine that in together uh, for those gene targets, okay? Um, this, is, this has been value assigned at 200,000 international, or excuse me, inter, uh, 200,000 droplet digital PCR copies per ml, and it has a background of human genomic DNA at 75,000 copies per ml. Okay. Um, the negative standard is essentially the 75,000 droplet or uh, genomic DNA copies against that and then you can see on the next slide here we're showing exactly what the gene target region is uh, Richie, so. sorry. sorry to yeah thanks thanks it's back yep. all right go ahead no problem so as you can see on the on the e n and s two hundred thousand copies per ml and then the orf one a and one b And as I said, we did uh, value assign this material using droplet digital PCR. It includes all relevant RNA targets to cover the wide uh, range of assay targets that are on the market. Um, it can be used for validation or independent control. And the matrices do include human genomic DNA as a background, and it's designed to validate the entire process. So just like the rest of our controls, this will go through extraction, amplification, and detection. 
So with that, I will hand it back to Marcus. Uh, I think to Rashida. Right? I think it's what, sorry, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Perfect. So hi, everyone. My name is Rashida. Thank you, uh, Marcus and Richie, for the first steps. So um, one of our objectives as, an, as a manufacturing company is also to provide as much solution as possible to tackle the, the COVID outbreak that we are still altogether discovering. Um, our next product that will be coming very soon and is already actually available is a serology test. From what we have heard uh, since the beginning, of course, the molecular, molecular testing such as PCR is the state of the art and the mandatory uh, test that must be produced for SARS-CoV confirmation. But at some point, we will um, need to uh, very much follow up on the surveillance, confirmation and diagnostics and see what can be the immune status to get more visibility on the disease, the kinetics, the, the way that a patient can be released or not, the population can be unlocked or not. So our kit is already um, available. It is a microplate essay, ELISA format, that will be available in 96 tests and 480 uh, tests. Um, it is CE marked, and we have also applied for the FDA emergency use authorization. So we are hoping that it comes very soon. The most um, the, the the kit will be used for both uh, diagnosis and surveillance in conjunction, of course, uh, to the regular standard method. It will come as a, as a support for uh, completing what cannot be seen and detected by PCR and other alternative methods. The most important uh, feature is that this um, serology test is able to detect what we call the total antibody. So it will be IgA, IgM, and IgG all together. This test will be, of course, uh, released with um, <clears throat> Sorry, with what we say, what we call an essay protocol file, it is validated on our system and platforms. For example, the um, the Evolis Premium here that you can see a fully automated Elisa testing, and also available to be used on our semi-manual um, automates that also exist on the on the field. So far, the sensitivity that have been um, that have been, sorry, the, the sensitivity of the kit is about um, 99, more than 99, sorry, um, sorry, 97% of, uh, like 97% and the specificity is more than 99% um, so far. There, we didn't uh, see any cross reaction towards many multiple samples that were, um, either for Epstein-Barr or many other disease and common influenza vaccine, common coronaviruses that may be um, um, visible and detected in some patients. There was no cross-reaction for us also. That would be it for the clinical update. We'll come back um, a lot more sooner with a clarification and also possibility to have access to um, the publication. Next slide, please. So in summary, I would like to thank all my colleagues and to thank the ISLM members for giving us the opportunity to give you some insight of what we have available, what is our next possibility, and next solution that we may uh, provide to tackle this disease that we still are um, discovering and somehow try to battle all together. Um, <clears throat> If you hear me. Yeah. Okay. Um, all the resources will be available um, directly on our website. One of the most important things that we haven't mentioned is that as a manufacturer, we have a footprint around the globe and especially in Africa. We do provide uh, support and we do provide technical assistance and expertise. We know that there is a multiplicity of brands available of systems and it's not so easy to somehow straightforward 
uh, run the tests and the technical assistance is one of the main uh, difference. So if you have any uh, struggles, if you face any issues, don't hesitate to come back to any of us, either locally or remotely, we will be able to provide you a support on all our technologies. Thank you very much. And we can go on next slide. Yeah. So these are the links to our different report, uh, support and resources all available through our uh, barret.com website. So feel free to, to connect and uh, to check it out. Thank you, that's the end of our presentation. Um, thank you very much, uh, Barret team. And thank you again to the Abbott uh, team for this very wonderful two presentations, uh, both very um, informative uh, the number of participants uh, in the, on the uh, call today is testimony that these are platforms I think that people really are using and will be interested to know more. Um, we will now move into the questions and answer segment uh, and uh, we'll pick questions both from the chat and those that were also submitted uh, prior to the call. Uh, and uh, one of the most recurring, uh, I think, questions uh, I'll we'll start with the one for Abbott, has been to do with the uh, ability to use the instruments for other kids as well. Uh, for example, this one from Chishamiso, and I can see another one from Nasifa. Uh, they say, I'd like to know how much uh, of the Abbott platform, I, this one specifically said M2000, does Abbott allow to be used for other testing platforms? I know that the platform can be used for other tests, non abort and there's an emerging need to open the platform for other tests. Uh, Nasifa had also said something in the same uh, uh, lens by saying, can you discuss the use of the Abbott platform using extraction and detection kits from other companies? Uh, Dr. Lissage. Sure. Um, so I'll start with um, the capabilities of the platform itself. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the start, this platform does have polyvalent capabilities, not just, um, you know, utilizing our reagents, but also it does have that open mode um, capability as well. And what that means is that you could utilize our extraction reagents and use somebody else's um, for amplification and detection on the M2000RT. So that again, you know, expands your testing capabilities of that platform. So you, you know, not only are able to use our um, assay and our reagents, but you're also able to use, um, you know, somebody else's um, amplification and detection reagents. Um, and we have had a number of um, investigators that have looked at that, you know, that have brought on the CVC assay on the M2000 system, um, utilizing our extraction and then utilizing CVC primers, um, you know, for amplification and detection. We've had a similar approach um, of customers where they've done our extraction and utilized um, the Thermo Fisher uh, reagents for amplification and detection. So there's definitely, um, you know, instances and, uh, you know, customers that have expanded that testing capability on the M2000 beyond just, um, you know, our SARS-CoV-2 assay. And, you know, since the platform has that capability, um, you know, that's, you know, really up to the customer to decide what's most appropriate based on their testing need. Um, but, you know, they would be able to use the system for open mode extraction, um, as well as open mode amplification and detection on the back end. And that's really that amplification and detection, um, you know, is really irrelevant of who you might be end up, might, might end up using um, for that piece. Um, regarding the extraction question, I will tell you that we have not to date looked at somebody else's extraction reagent onto the system, um, but it is something that we are um, considering. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lusic. Um, I'll move on to the next question and uh, I'd like the, either Marcus or Richie or Rachida to maybe respond to this one. Um, and it will also uh, apply to uh, Dr. Lusic. First, um, you might have uh, answered this, but maybe for the benefit of those that joined later, what are the target genes for biorad systems? And then um, you could 
combined with the following question. Uh, if it's from TESFA in Addis, uh, if we need to run a pool of samples together, is the sensitivity and specificity of the test uh, going to be affected by the machines? Please let us know, that's what he says. If we run uh, pool samples together, will sensitivity and specificity be affected? Um, please go ahead, uh, Bayarat, then about to come in. Okay. Um, I may stop here. <laughs> if I might, is Marcus. Yes. Marcus. <laughs> Thank you, Anachi. Um, yeah, I think definitely the question um, in terms of pooling samples is a good one. Um, and yeah, of course, pooling samples would mean that you kind of dilute samples at the same time. And uh, this will decrease the sensitivity in terms of uh, the detection for the individual sample. But uh, of course, the advantage of uh, sam sampling can be to have a higher throughput. So I think that is broadly discussed currently in how far it may make sense to do this pooling because then you have to retest as well. If, if it turns out to be positive, you have to do single tests anyway. Um, I think there is no final conclusion so far from what I know. OK, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lusic, any? reaction to pulling? Hello? All right. Can you hear me? Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, sorry, yeah. my apologies. Um, uh, I was stating that, you know, I don't have a different opinion than Marcus um, just, you know, explained. I think the con concern is when you have low positive specimens and you're pulling um, different samples together, that's definitely going to affect your sensitivity and you can potentially have false negatives in that instance. So that's, I think that's one concern, but, um, you know, it, it's something to be considered as we're looking at scaling up of the testing. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from I tell you. Uh, and he says, the virus genes targeted so far include the N, the E, the S, the RDRP genes. How, I think you wanted to say, how predictable is the mutation uh, in the target region that affects the performance of the assay? I can start from Abbott's perspective. Um, we're targeting the RDRP and the N regions of the gene. Um, our analysis, you know, very early on demonstrated the regions we selected um, are highly conserved. Um, you know, there's been several studies that have um, demonstrated mutations within the N region um, or um, deletion. And we've looked at those studies and we've noted that our assay is not impacted um, by those mutations um, that have been identified to this point. Um, I will also say, you know, the initial stages of developing a lot of these molecular assays, there was very limited data that was present in, in that, in the genome sequence um, database. Um, and there are approximately almost 1,400 sequences today. There's 1,383 sequences that have been uploaded into GenBank now. Um, and really, as of this past week, we've done that analysis again to ensure that our um, target regions are highly conserved and are not impacted by any potential mutations um, that our assay um, is targeting. And, you know, we are seeing that this, that this um, virus is, is highly conserved in some of the regions. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Lisic, uh, uh, Dr. Marcus. I think get... this is dedicated rather to uh, to our control standard and uh, the genes um, being covered in the control, from my understanding, right? So eventually, yeah. Richie is a better person to to answer. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, so what we did with the control is we we tried to represent exactly what would be you know uh, contained in a in a uh, patient sample in a clinical sample, and it is not the whole. Uh, viral particle that's been inactivated. Just to be clear, this is in vitro transcripts. 
uh, but it does cover the entire E, N, and S regions. And then for O, R, F, 1A, and 1B, we've taken fragments of that to cover uh, the, 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 the genome. And it, it, it will work for most assays out there depending on what they're detecting for. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Richie. Uh, I'll take the next question um, from Veronica Arnold. Uh, and uh, she says, what are the impacts of using only PCR for screening and surveillance? Because in my country, they do not use serology tests, they use PCR only. It takes longer for the patient to test negative. As we have evidence, uh, a patient still tests positive even after six weeks of treatment. Uh, any comments on that from either of you? Maybe we could start with uh, you, uh, Richie, since you're on time. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not sure. I, I would actually hand this over to Marcus. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now, perhaps a, a remark here. I, I guess we would expect really um, with a serological kit, we, we cannot do this kind of testing. We would expect to use serologically testing in conjunction with uh, RNA detection, basically. Thank you. Um, anyone who wants to further comment? I saw Rachida, uh, Dr. Lusic. Yeah, I think that the, the two um, mo modes need to be really used in tandem, right? They're complementary. You you need to do both um, serology as well as PCR. Uh, I know that P that serology is lagging a little bit from a development perspective, but I think that there's a number of assays that have come to market over the last uh, month or so, and I think that there's additional ones that are looking to come um, to market. But I do see them being used, um, you know, as complements of each other. Thank you. Um... Yes, uh, and, and I think that's, that's a very pertinent question that keeps on coming. Um, but for now, as we have mentioned, I think we continue to rely on the WHO guidance, which is not yet recommended uh, uh, the rapid uh, test kits, um, either both antibody or antigen tests, uh, uh, as you saw in one of the diagrams, I think it was from markers. There they is still quite a lot to, to learn uh, in terms of uh, immunity. But uh, I think in a couple of weeks' time, hopefully, I think new information will keep on coming and we will be having, uh, I think, uh, more to discuss when it comes to uh, those uh, essays. Um, I have this question also, um, Danigela from Julie Awino, who is asking about the stability of the test using Abbott M2000 for various sample types. So the, um, the kit itself, we have it approved for um, nasal collection um, that's self-collected or um, in a clinician setting um, or clinician collected. And then it's also approved for oral pharyngeal and nasal pharyngeal swabs. Um, once those swabs are collected, um, they're placed in the viral transport media. Um, and our um, specimen stability is up to 48 hours um, at between 2 to 25 for a transport um, to the laboratory for testing. Thank you. Thank you, Danigela. Um, I think this one, uh, the next one, again, is probably directed to the standard controls from BioRat. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and this is from Vini Kanmao who is asking, is there any greater advantage for an assay to target all five specific genes of COVID-19? Are, so are there any probes designed for that? Um, I think there were quite a number of questions around this, so we could address this together. Um, yeah, so, so from my perspective, I, you know, that just depends on your assay that you're developing. I don't know, actually, if there are already any assays that cover the all five gene targets, um, but I can just speak specifically to the standard, and, and the standard does, uh, you know, uh, cover those five gene targets. Yeah, I, I, I may add to this, Richie, if you don't mind, because um, we use two regions in the N-gene according to the CDC recommendations in our DDPCR kit. 
Um, the standard includes all five regions, so they can be used with all commercially available kits. That is the rational behind. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Danijila, you want to respond to that? Or? Yeah, I mean, the only other thing that I will add, you know, obviously, um, you know, having more than a single region provides you that redundancy in coverage, ensuring that, you know, if, there, if your initial target region isn't able to, um, you know, accurately detect uh, that viral strain, you know, having that second region provides you that assurance and coverage. Um, you know, obviously, as more target um, regions that you add to your asset, the more complexity that adds, um, you know, from sensitivity and specificity perspective. But ideally, I think that, you know, current standard practice for um, PCR methodologies, regardless of which virus you're looking at, really is, I would say, two different target regions, um, you know, would, should be sufficient to provide you that adequate sensitivity and specificity. Thank you. Um, whilst you are there as well, I think I have uh, another question from Elvis. We might have touched on this, but for the benefit, I think for those that didn't get it, um, he is asking around, um, I think there are three questions, but basically he's talking about internal, how are internal controls taken care of in the M2000? He asked about the city values and the principle for extraction. He asked whether it's based on magnetic beads or based on column filters. Sure. So I'll start with the extraction. Our extraction is uh, magnetic bead based, um, you know, very similar to what we use for HIV qualitative assay that's being used in the field for early infant diagnosis. So um, the same approach that we use for that assay is what, we've, what we're utilizing here. Um, from an internal Hello, control we perspective. Can, we've lost you a bit. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? All right, I think we've lost. Anapi, can you hear me? You are back now. Okay, <laughs> my apologies. Um, so I was mentioning that our extraction chemistry is very similar to what we use for our HIV qualitative assay that's being used in the field for um, EID um, testing. So same approach there um, that we use for SARS-CoV-2. From an internal control perspective, we are adding a non-competitive internal control um, to the lysis buffer. And that internal control then assesses extraction efficiency and PCR amplification um, through that whole process. So you add it at a point um, that you add your sample to that lysis buffer, and then it's carried through the whole process to ensure that you have adequate extraction and amplification. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Danijela. Um, I'll also take this question from Julie. Uh, I think it will be applicable to both, so feel free to jump in. Uh, based on the sample types, which one will be uh, which one will be the best for looking at active infection? How do we ensure that we don't have false positives uh, associated with the amplification of genome from already dead viruses? It's from Julie Awino Okonji. I think it's a very good question. And I think that there are ongoing discussions in this regard, uh, especially do, during the um, convalescence phase of patients with a decreasing um, RNA virus level in how far a still measurable RNA level is still infectious. And I don't think that there is any conclusive result currently because we have too little data, as as I know. But Daniela may know better. I, I think, yeah, I, I don't have any additional information. I mean, we know that based on um, surveillance that we've done across, um, you know, customers that have been utilizing the assay for the past um, two months, you know, we we see a wide dispersion of um, viral shedding from the patients. Um, you know, nobody's done that testing to see, you know, in those late stages, how much of that virus is actually viable. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lucic. This one is from Adesola. Um, it came privately. Uh, we also encourage you to post to everyone. So I think we can, everybody can benefit. Uh, Adesola says, uh, I need clarification on the DD-PCR by Biora. 
do you need to extract the NRA or you process the specimen straight? Did you get the principle of the test? Now, the, the process uh, is, this regards in terms of sample preparation, quite similar to what you do when you run real-time quantitative PCR. Um, I think that sample preparation generally is a, is a big topic, has become a big topic in, in the context of uh, COVID-19 infection. And I know that um, different research groups are looking for um, alternative and fast um, methods for sample preparation. The one, the one uh, advantage of digital droplet PCR obviously is um, that it is more resistant against any inhibitors in the PCR. Uh, that is well known and that is one of the strengths of digital droplet PCR. Thank so you. If you have samples that are not absolutely pure, you will get a quite reliable and uh, even quantitative result. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, maybe we'll take an, uh, one or two more questions. Um, um, what are some of the uh, factors that affect the validity of tests, both at pre and post uh, uh, testing? Uh, yeah, both at pre and, 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 and testing and during testing uh, phases. So perhaps I can start. Um, Sanasi, uh, can you hear me? Oh, let's go ahead, thanks. Um, so I think from a validity perspective, one of the you know key pieces that affect the assay performance, um, you know, especially with this particular virus, is going to be you know specimen quality and stability. Um, you know, we've seen that you know that can impact um, you know assay performance. So ensuring that the specimens are processed you know, within that 48 hour window, um, and if not possible that they're stored, um, you know, at colder temperatures until you're able to do the testing. Um, that's really one of the, you know, key pieces that we've seen that could affect um, assay performance and, and that invalid rate um, to date. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Lisich. Um, Marcus, Richie, you want to add anything? No. I think that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'll take one last question. I uh, hope I'm not so sure to whom this one is directed to. Does the addition of off-board lysis um, inactivate the specimen? Inactivate, inactivation is not part of the, of the package insert, though it is recommended. I, so I didn't get the question. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, uh, Dr. Lusich. Yeah. So, yeah, there have been um, studies that have demonstrated that addition of um, surfactants like uh, guanidine isothiocyanate, which could be in various different manufacturers' um, license buffers, right, could inactivate um, the virus. You know, as part of our procedure, we don't include an inactivation step. Um, the caution is if you are adding lysis buffer to that sample prior to extraction, you are diluting that particular specimen, right? So that, um, although you're inactivated, you also may be impacting your sensitivity because you're diluting that um, sample at the start. Okay, thank you. Thank you about that. Um, Marcus, you wanted to take it? Um, no, that's perhaps. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. Again, that, that, that is a good point in regards to, to, uh, to just uh, point out the advantage of digital droplet PCR, because yeah. it's rather not affected by this kind of, uh, of effects that you need to take care of running real-time PCR applications, right? Okay. Um, the, the major concern regarding digital droplet PCR is the throughput. From what I hear, yeah, sample throughput, mm -hmm. and um, perhaps it's some interesting information for some people in the audience that, uh, depending on the equipment used, uh, testing can be uh, 1,000 samples per day. Like uh, I mentioned, this company Biodesics in the US, they are currently testing 1,000 samples per day 
and they are planning to increase that. So sometimes the association with digital droplet PCR is still that, yes, it's a great technology, but the throughput is low. Um, no, it must not be, it can be um, increased really. Thank you, uh, great insights indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are almost uh, nearing our time. Uh, we acknowledge all the questions that are in the chat and uh, we will follow up with the experts that have been sharing this information with us uh, that they could provide, I think, the uh, responses uh, to the many questions uh, in writing uh, that we should be able to be posting on the, on the website now. Um, it has been a great session indeed. I just want to ask uh, a representative from uh, Bayarat uh, to give uh, 30 seconds of last remarks. Uh, Marcus, maybe. Okay. Um, th thank you very much, Anafi and the IRSM member for uh, having us again today. Thank you also, Marcus, and thank you very much, Richie, for uh, providing as much information as possible to the audience. I hope it was really uh, useful. We do hope so. And feel free any time to contact us. Um, so, Mr. Anafi, if there's any other question that might not have been responded so far, please feel free to email all of us and we'll get back to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Danigela, uh, 30 seconds, last remarks. Sure. Um, so thank you for the opportunity again to provide you with an update of, of what our teams um, have been working on. And again, if there's an opportunity that we can um, help you, support you as you look at um, scaling up this testing within your countries with the existing equipment that you already have, please let us know and our teams are happy to support you in any way we can. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, I also would like to remind you um, to subscribe and become an ASLM member so you continue to get uh, the latest updates. Uh, we'll also be sharing uh, slides, I think, to the database. Um, we also capture, I think, the emails that came through this session. Um, so keep on checking the website. Uh, please register, become a member, and enjoy the benefits uh, from ASLM, uh, for example, receiving these slides, um, discounts during our major events like conferences and uh, many more. Um, uh, we have posted a poll uh, uh, just on your screens right now. Uh, please find a few seconds to just uh, tell us what you think about the session so that we continue to provide you with uh, quality uh, feedback. Um, from me uh, and the rest of my colleagues, uh, we appreciate all of you from coming. We appreciate the presenters uh, and we appreciate all of you for the fight that we are putting against this uh, pandemic uh, till we see us winning um, the war against COVID-19. Uh, we shall continue to fight together. Thank you and goodbye.